good question. Every ounce of my foundation is just rooted in music. Would you sing me a line from your new song? I'm a creature of habit. I'm hooked once I have it in my habit. You. You keep making the same mistake over and over again. Is your ex the same person with a different name? I make new mistakes. What's your favorite movie? <laughs> I didn't expect that. <laughs> I don't know where that came from. The depths of my soul. Thank you so much. You just spoke life into me, Carlos. Hey family, it's Carlos Watson. I have a terrific show for you today. My guest at age 13 became the youngest solo artist in history to top the Billboard chart, something that Elvis didn't do, Michael Jackson didn't do, you name it. Thanks to her debut single, Leave, Get Out. Today, JoJo is still going strong. She's got a brand new single out to prove it, entitled Creatures of Habit. Buckle in, you're gonna enjoy my time with the singer simply known as JoJo. Jojo. Hi, <laughs> <laughs> Carlos. Hey, you know what? I'm going to take that as you are welcoming me in a good way. So thank you. And, uh, and hello. Hello. Thanks for having me. Where are you? I'm actually in New Jersey, just doing a little tour of the East Coast right now for personal reasons, not for like tours. And where did you grow up? I was raised mostly in Massachusetts and my dad was in Nashua, New Hampshire. So I would sometimes spend weekends in Nashua, but mostly like south of Boston, Foxborough. I'm not getting any of that Massachusetts accent. I wish I still had it when I was back with my family last week. It definitely came out. I always have loved accents. Me too. And I like the Massachusetts ones. They used to have this thing where they would say, it's a wicked pissa. Do they still oh, yeah. say that? It's wicked good. I was wicked tired. <laughs> yeah, we definitely keep that tradition alive of using the word wicked. And also the bubbler. I don't know if you knew if you've heard the term bubbler, but this is one of the reasons why I don't have an accent anymore. Because when I was 11 and I lived in LA for a few months, I asked the teacher in front of all the kids in the class I was in, where's the bubbler? And the whole class erupted in laughter. And I was asking, where's the water fountain? And nobody understood what I was asking. And they were just like, this weird girl from Boston. I was just like, I'm never gonna talk like that again. <laughs> I think accents are the best. Even being on tour, yeah, I've been to the Dakotas and the Carolinas. And I think sometimes I end up even adopting little things that, that are said, or if I'm in a city, I end up subconsciously trying to talk like that. It's really interesting how that works. It's right. a sign of endearment, I guess. I don't know. I'm reminded that you get to do something that very few people in this life will ever get to do, which is oh, you've gotten yeah. to go around and see different places. That is one of my favorite parts of what I get to do. Tell me what you Now, why did you start singing so early? Was you, were you just a beautiful singer or was your mom or dad an aspiring singer and they passed it on to you? Both my parents can sing. My dad passed away a few years ago, but my mom is still here and there was music constantly in the house. And they were together for a few years when I was younger. So that's like when my dad would be playing the harmonica and the guitar. My mom would be practicing show tunes because she would be in a choral group or a musical. I think the music they fell in love to was James Taylor and Joni Mitchell and the Eagles and classic rock and things like that, as well as soul. So music was constantly playing from the time I was conceived. So you, you were the daughter of uh, 70s hippies. Yeah, pretty much. They were free spirits for sure. And I wasn't planned, but I was definitely a, a fruit of love and music. Yeah, what a nice way to, to say that and what a nice thing to be true. Every ounce of my foundation is just rooted in music, I feel, because that's the, my first love. Well, what was it like for them to have loved music as much as they did and then to see the magical thing happen and that their daughter is not just good at it, she's great at it and she's got hit records? Both of them were very supportive and my mom managed me from the first time I ever sang professionally, which was around six years old. And 
I was more passionate about it than they ever were from what they told me. Like I was obsessed. It was very clear that I, I was destined to do something with music. What you want from me? I would say I'm sorry if I really meant it. No apologies. I would say I'm sorry if I really meant it. Do you know what would have happened if you, if you couldn't have done music or if it hadn't worked out well? I really enjoyed school and I did have a lot of different interests, including dinosaurs, which I have this <laughs> tattoo. I once had a dream of being a paleontologist. When I was making my decision to either stay in Boston or move to LA when I turned 18, I had committed to Northeastern University and I was going to go for sociology and anthropology. And I ended up deciding to move to LA and trying to work things out with my record label at the time. I did read about it, but I didn't hear the real backstory. And I've, I've talked to people like Jason Derulo who had issues with his label and Lenny Kravitz and other people who've told me various pieces of that. What happened for you as a uh, as a young singer? Put out my first single, I was 13. My life changed, it was incredible. Youngest solo artist to have a number one. And then I released first album, toured the world. Second album at 15, had another huge hit with Too Little Too Late. And then started doing movies. And there were things going on behind the scenes with my record label on the business side that were affecting me and my business. It just turned into a situation where they were no longer a functioning record label, but they wouldn't let me go. So I wasn't able to sign anywhere else or sing without their permission and they wouldn't grant permission or they would have unreasonable asks. There's actually a really great YouTube video on on this. Me and my team were looking for an out. The lawyer that I had looked through the contract and was like, um, this is ironclad, you're never getting out of this. We literally had litigators and attorneys tell her, you're probably never going to be able to be a part of this industry again in a way that you're used to. Thankfully, I found some litigators who were willing to take it on and, and I was able to get the rights to my voice back and just move forward with my career. These days, you don't really sound the same. Do you still have the same praise that you did when you were 14 girls? Do you, uh, do you enjoy the studio? Are you one of these people who's there late into the night and early in the morning? I like to go in with an intention. I don't like to waste my money. So I'll come into the studio and we'll, we'll get to work. But we have a great time and we cry and we'll create things and we'll try things. But since I've been in this game for so long, I know how the time can rack up in the studio. But uh, I, being in the studio is probably the place I've spent the most time in my life. I'm very comfortable there. I feel very confident as a vocal producer. And I've recently really got my confidence back as a writer. And just because as a human, I have kind of exist on the sliding scale of insecurity versus security. And sometimes I'm like, do I suck? Am I great? Somewhere in between, what's up? Being back in the practice of it and going to the studio, especially after the pandemic and being locked down, now getting back in has really felt like a return to what I love to do. And what did you do over the last year? So my mom had just moved from Massachusetts to California and moved in with me. That was gonna be a temporary thing while she found work. And it was, it was great having her live with me. I'm an only child, so we, worked out together, we had coffee in the morning, we'd write each other little notes. And I was promoting my album. I, I released an album last year called Good To Know. And I'm so grateful that I was able to release music during this time because it kept me sane, being able to interact with people about it and get out this body of work that was really so much about being in your head and about facing yourself. And that's what a lot of people were forced to do, whether they wanted to or not. That's why I didn't feel like I should delay the album. And I'm glad that I was able to put it out and that it was a part of people's quarantine experience. all the songs on it equally or was there a favorite song or or two all of them have a reason for being on there but maybe i'll show some favoritism to the song called think about you i'm gonna i'm gonna think of you i'm gonna think about you i'm gonna think about you 
I love Think About You because it's so very much where I was at that time, which was just feeling like I'll never get over my ex. Because that's how I feel every single time. I'm like, I'll never love again. My life is over. So dramatic. So that's just exactly where I was. Now, do you keep making the same mistake over and over again? Is your ex the same person with a different name every time? Ooh, that's such a good question. Uh, no, I make new mistakes. Yeah, I've, I've made some weird choices over the years. <laughs> and I've written about it the whole time. Would you sing me a line from your new song? Sometimes I fantasize that you're cheating on me or we fight so bad you walk out on me. Sounds like drama. It does. I was going to say, I was, <laughs> that's not what I was expecting, but that was still good. And then the hook is like, I'm a creature of habit. I'm hooked once I have it in my habit. You always you. Creature of habit. That's what it's called. I love it. I love it. You say I'm a creature. Did you and your mom, when you had this year together, did you guys talk about that very much at all? We talked a lot about her tendencies, her habits and relationships, and how seeing that probably impacted how I've moved in relationships. And we just try to support each other. And sometimes I want her to give me advice and be like, Mom, what do you think about this? Or do you like this guy? And she's like, she's kind of like, Joe, don't ask me because I have no, I, I, she's like, I, I didn't have success in relationships. So you, you gotta be the one to figure it out. I'm like, damn, I need help. <laughs> That's good that you guys uh, got that time uh, together. I, um, I, I'm curious as to what the next year is going to be like for all of us. My next year is going to look very much on the road. I'm going to go on tour next year. We'll start in America and then go overseas, come back Canada. And I'm, I'm excited because I've spent most of my life living out of a suitcase. So I'm very used to that and I really enjoy it. Now, I love traveling. Where's the most beautiful place you've ever been? Hmm, most beautiful? Uh -huh. Bali. I love the Amalfi Coast. Positano, Ravello, Torrento, and then Capri. Yeah, I got to take my mom there for Mother's Day years ago. And just never seen bluer waters, never drank more wine, like, Pizza in America is just, it'll never be the same after having pizza on the Amalfi Coast. I love the desert. I mean, even though I'm an East Coast girl, for some reason I've always felt drawn to the desert. So I love New Mexico, Arizona, all things like that. The sky's like the full moon. I, I'm, I'm so inspired by the natural landscape and the colors there and everything. Have you been to Australia before? Yes, I actually filmed a movie there. I filmed Aquamarine there. How about we start packing the room? So how about I live here with Claire till I'm 18? <laughs> I was there for three months. I love Australia. One of my writing partners, Nat Dunn, lives there and just is building out this studio compound. I love to travel. I know that acting has been a part of your, of your career. Are you doing very much in terms of that or mainly music for the moment? I want to get back into acting. I didn't take it as seriously as I wish I did, but I was really depressed around the time that I was going through a lawsuit with my record label, like toward my late teens and early 20s. And I, I don't think I had the heart or the energy to give my all to anything else because I was, I just really thought my life was over, like when I was not able to release music. But I love acting. I came to love it around the same time that I started singing. I mean, musical theater and all that was like one in the same. So um, I would love to, I would love to, but I don't want to just jump into anything. So I want to wait for the right project. And, you know, I need to, I need to prove myself in that space. So I'm willing to do that. Have you thought about um, taking on a more business role in the music industry? Absolutely. It's been a desire of mine since I was a little girl. Well, yeah, a teenager. I would walk into boardrooms and meet with executives and just be like, there's no reason I can't do this. Also, from an A&R perspective, I feel so passionately about helping other artists find their sound and encouraging them or hipping them to the reality of what goes on in this industry. I actually have a label called Clover Music. 
I'm the first artist signed to it and it's through Warner. And I eventually would like to grow that. So I just have too much experience and expertise in this area not to share it and expand on it. You should trust yourself. You should bet you should bet on yourself. Thank you so much. You just spoke life into me, Carlos. I think that insecurities and comparison over the years since I started out so young and I had such success and then I've seen such heights, I've seen such lows and experienced them personally and in a way that really affected me and made me very anxious and depressed and that's just the way that I internalized it. So a lot of this new season in my life is getting over myself and shedding that, that hard exterior or that protective mechanism that I've developed. Before I go, I want to do um, something with you I call rapid fire. Let's do it. What's your favorite movie of all time? Beetlejuice. Oh, I didn't expect that. Okay. <laughs> I don't know where that came from. The depths of my soul. Your favorite TV series? Handmaid's Tale. If you could meet anyone, dead or alive, who would you love to meet? Whitney Houston. Jojo, uh, this was uh, this was too much fun. Thank you so much. I really love your style of interview and just how natural and enjoyable it was. Jojo, Kruta, take one. I really liked it when you start, when you guys started getting into like, did you ever think about becoming on the sort of the business side? No. Like, Absolutely. And I, I thought the same thing. It's like she's she's gonna own her. Own, yeah. I guess she has her own label now. I remember her music from way back when. I used to play her songs all the time, and she actually helped me get through some difficult times. I really like the way the interview opened up with her, just kind of like, it, yes, it yeah, was like, that something? Right on yeah. up. When she was talking about what happened between her and her, like her record label, I don't know how I would react. Not being able to perform my passion and feeling like my voice or whatever I'm doing is owned by someone else, by a different entity. I'm pretty sure like that would have like messed my head. So like to see where she's at right now, that's super cool. I really hope you enjoyed that. Big fan of hers, not just for what she's done, but for how strong she's been and the good stuff that's ahead. Something tells me JoJo could be our next Barry Gordy one day. She could be the one who's making it true for lots of interesting musicians, including herself. Big thanks to her. Listen, if you like today's show, you can always get more. Like, subscribe, enjoy the podcast, and do the best thing of all, tell a friend. Sharing's caring. Be safe. We'll see you soon. It's still the night shift, just brighter. Still a night out, but everything fits in. Chevrolet, making life's journey just better. Joining us now are students at Summit Sierra High School. Now, they come from different backgrounds, but we're sharing a classroom today. Better than that, we're having a candid conversation about education, including race and education. I'm the son and grandson of teachers uh, and spend time in a lot of schools. I've probably been in over a thousand schools, I think, around the world. Wow. Probably across 50 countries. How have any of you seen race play out in schooling and education, good, bad, or otherwise? For me, how I think like race definitely plays into that is the support system. Like when you don't have people that are higher up or role models that you can look up to that look like you, it affects you. How can I be as great when there's no one else there to look up to. Black girls are misunderstood, misread. Um, a lot of their identities, teachers do not understand. Or oftentimes, you know, they are, they are victims. And if we can have policies and education reform, real education reform, that really gets at the most marginal in our society, we're gonna be able to make some real changes. Who else has seen race play out in any interesting ways in education? I think that's a big issue in a lot of public schools because of the way society views race and views black men specifically. You end up with a lot of black men being sent um, to into detention and missing out on school. Like he's saying, the, the punishment system, the school to prison pipeline, the bells, the the, the detention room, missing learning, uh, just all that. And mostly black kids, uh, the security officer will hang around the basketball court where the black kids are playing basketball. At School Tuesday, Shamel says his son's teacher took this staged photo with a foot on his neck. Your son has learned to lie to everybody and make excuses. Because you taught him to make excuses that nothing is his fault. This is what black people do. This is 
I personally believe that police aren't needed in the school place. I think, I understand security, but I, I think that security is different than police. When we start policing black and brown students from that early of an age, that's when they start getting stuck in the cycle.